It is such a gift to be together in this time, in this moment in world history. So there was a moment of tenderness that took place yesterday during the protests in Center City. I don't know if any of you saw it, or maybe you saw it on the news, that Dr. Carrie Ann Perkins and Michael Gordon moved from their micro wedding ceremony on the lawn of the Logan Hotel out into the protests. Her in this beautiful uh, wedding gown with a long train and a long veil, him in a tuxedo, and they stepped into the center of the protest crowd and they shared a newlywed kiss and then they stood together and raised their fists in solidarity with the movement of, uh, to support black lives. It was an incredible moment of, um, of how black love and the movement for Black Lives Matter are intersecting right now. It's an incredible moment of, um, of public tenderness. The doctor, uh, Dr. Cornell West, says that justice is what love looks like in public, like how tenderness is how love feels in private. Justice is what love looks like in public, the way tenderness is what love feels like in private. And I've been thinking a lot about our mission statement this week of awakening love and justice in our lives, in our private lives, and in the world, in public. I want to think about all those moments of tenderness about how we feel love in our private lives when a cat reaches out to put its paw on us, when a baby smiles or we feel the hug of a parent, the caress of a lover, when we share tears of joy with a friend. All of these moments of tenderness, which are how we know love in our personal lives. Dr. West says that like those moments, justice is what love looks like in public. When we come together in the public sphere to make the world that we know is possible, the world where every life is given opportunity, is given the chance to thrive, is given the chance to become the fullness of itself. And in particular, when we work together to right the wrongs that keep some lives from being able to thrive or even survive. And so at this moment, we are, um, we're in what I'm beginning to see as a, um, a great love story, a story that arose from tragedy, but has the potential to become one of the greatest love stories of our country that love that is justice in public. And yet a lot of us, I think, a lot of the conversations I've had with you and with, um, with my own heart, the conversations I've had with my partner and my family and friends are about what is our work to do in this moment? How can we be brave, like Ellery was singing to us and calling us to be earlier? What does it mean for us to be brave? I've been thinking about the sign that I saw a protester holding in DC this morning that says, all hands on deck for this revolution. Each one of us has a role to play in this moment, in this tragic, enormous love story of our country working together to become more just. Each one of us has a role to play and each one of us needs to be on deck and working to make this justice, this more just world happen. But it's a challenging time, right? Some of us are at higher risk for COVID-19 or we live with someone who is or we work with people who are and so we're afraid of going out into the streets or violating our curfew in any or our, our, uh, our quarantine in any way because we fear making it worse for someone we love. Or maybe 
you're a white person and don't know what your role is in this movement that is led by black and indigenous and people of color leadership. Or maybe you're an older person and you don't know what to do in this movement that is led by younger people. Or maybe you're just newer to the work of racial justice in this movement that lifts up wokeness and pays so much attention to whether we get it right or wrong, this movement that feels high risk for mistakes. Even those of us who are at the center of leadership are wondering whether we're good enough, whether we can bring enough, whether we're strong enough, whether even if we give it our all that this moment will become the transformational moment that our country and our world need. What is our part in this story? That's what I wanna be talking together about today. And I know that many of us have been um, in conversation throughout the week with one another. Some of us have seen each other out on the streets. Some of us have been following each other on social media or organizing together. I want to share a couple of the guideposts that have been my sort of ethical guideposts that have been guiding my my discernment at this moment about how I can become involved and what, what role I have to play in this story. The first one is um, that I've been holding on to was lifted up by an organizer who's been leading uh, a lot of these protests in Center City. His name is Sam and on uh, Wednesday or Thursday at the Art Museum we had marched from City Hall and at the end of the protest, Sam got the bullhorn and, and he reminded the protesters um, that, they, that he wasn't the one who brought them there. He said something like, I didn't bring you here and I didn't bring you here and I didn't bring you here. You brought yourselves here. Each one of us is bringing ourselves to this movement right now. And what gets us involved is our own inner strength. And so attend, we must attend to our inner strength, he said. Each one of us needs to be in this movement, not just for a day, not just for an afternoon, not just for one march or one uh, call-in demonstration, but for a lifetime. And so the way that we do that is by tending to our own inner strength and helping to build our own resilience. So that's the first guidepost that I'm thinking about is not depleting my strength, but tending to my own inner strength as the main thing that will keep me coming back, keep me continuing to be involved and keep me useful in this movement. The second is something that one of my uh, Jewish colleagues lifted up, Rabbi Mordechai Liebling, this week. What he said was that um, in Judaism, or at least in his form of Judaism, humility, the word humility, is basically defined as taking up the right amount of space. So humility is not about being humble, being in the background in the way that I've often been taught humility means. Humility means taking up the right amount of space. So for some of us, that means taking up more space, figuring out more how to fill, fill the word, world with our voice. I'm thinking particularly those of us who are people of color, those of us who are uh, black and brown, those of us whose voices have been traditionally silenced by our culture. So taking up more space for some of us. And humility also means taking up less space for others of us those of us who are white or who are otherwise privileged and otherwise often given too much space in the public, um, in the public sphere, our voices are heard too often or too loudly. So for so, some of us, it's taking up less space. And so tending to my inner strength and trying to be humble in the sense, not just of being small, but in the sense of taking up the right amount of space right now and in the right places. And the third guidepost is something that um, I've been thinking about a lot from a, a resource that the UUA, that El Reverend Elizabeth Wynn at the UUA created a, a couple of years ago. Um, and I'm wondering, Rick, if you can put this um, in the chat. It's the 
the UUA document called Risk, Courage, and Discernment. I think there's a link to it that Rick has available. This is something that um, I think many of you have seen on Facebook. Thanks. Okay, these are all the these are all of the resources. So it's that top that top link that Rick just put in the chat. Risk, courage, and discernment. One of the things that that document talks about, and I encourage you to read all of that document, especially if you're thinking about being out in the streets. But one of the things that document talks about is how this this moment and any moment like this causes us to grapple with our ego and our impact, and especially where those um, where those come into conflict. And so I'll tell you a little bit about how I've been doing that this week. Um, my ego will tell me that um, I want to be out there. I want to be seen as one of the good ones, one of the good clergy, one of the good white people right now. I want to be seen, I want good pictures to be taken of me at protests. I want people of color to affirm what I'm doing, tell me that I'm doing something right. Um, my ego tells me that, that's what my ego wants. But the more important thing to pay attention to right now is the impact of what I'm doing. And so what, what making the kind of impact in this moment requires, that I want to make, requires of me, is actually that my voice be more quiet, that every time, um, every time the microphone is passed to me, that I pass it to a person of color that every time my voice gets lifted up, that I instead turn it to amplifying the voices of people of color around me. And that I use my body um, not to be in leadership, but to be, um, to diffuse police uh, tension or police violence as much as I can. So grappling with our ego and the impact that we want to make and where those conflict, where they often do conflict, always prioritizing the impact that we want to make more than what our ego wants, um, wants for us. And so those are the guideposts that I'm thinking about right now. I invite you to wrestle with them as well. So again, that's, it's um, tending to your inner strength as the thing that will keep us in this the long haul, in the long haul, taking up the right amount of space, and grappling with your ego and with the impact that you want to make. And when you need to make a choice, always choosing your impact. So what is ours to do, my friends? There are 200 of us-ish on 200 screens here. We know that that probably means there's about 300 of us here on this Zoom meeting on this Sunday in June in Philadelphia and in the uh, United States of America and around the world. What is our work to do? There is no one answer to that. And if you're sitting on a couch at home with somebody, what your work is to do is different from the work of the person on the couch next to you. Your work is different than my work, which is different from every other individual person's work on this meeting right now. And those of you who are watching this YouTube video later on, it's different from your work too. Each of us has our own work to do, and there is no one right answer for what our work is. What I do know is that any, anything we choose will be criticized. That is part of how this, um, this movement gets better, is that we try and we listen to each other, and when we hit the wrong mark, people need to tell us, we need to tell other people, and then we do it better. And so part of what is really hard, I think, especially for those of us who are newcomers to this kind of work, is that we really, really want to get it right. And when someone tells us that we didn't get it right, it feels really, really hard to try again. So I want to just lift that up, that we are going to make mistakes and we are going to be criticized. But again, inner strength is what is, is, what is needed for the long haul. And so when, when we're criticized, we need to take a breath, read what someone said, filter out what of it is true, what we can learn from, and then get back to our own sense of resilience and our own sense of commitment to the work of dismantling racism in this world rather than our own fragile egos, our own fragile uh, 
sense of white identity if, if, we're, if you happen to be a white person. So we all have different work to do. That said, some of you were at our um, annual meeting last week, and one of the things that I talk about when I talk about how our budget works and how we as a congregation work is that we put our assets in service of a better world. So we've got this big, some of you probably even never been there, but we have this big, big old hulking, muscular, Victorian, historic, architecturally significant building in Center City in Philadelphia. And we use it to rent out, not only to, to carry out our own mission in the world, but to rent out space to educational institutions and political institutions um, and uh, artists and musicians. We use that building in service of a better world. Yesterday, some of your staff were at that building because we were a hub for the street medics and for the movement chaplains who were out in the protests. We're using our building in service of a better world right now. And when people ask us if we can use our space, we do everything that we can to use that asset in service of a better world. So I want you to think about your assets. If you're trying to use yourself, what you have in service of a better world, what does that look like for you? What does that look like for you? The four things, the four areas of my assets that I've been thinking about um, are my body or just my presence, using that as an asset that I can use in the service of a better world, using my resources and talents and skills, using my relationships and the influence that I have where I have influence. And finally, this is one that we don't often think of as an asset, but using my own capacity for growth and change as an asset. So my ability to get better, my ability to change and grow, that is one of the greatest assets that each one of us has right now. So our bodies, our resources, our relationships, and our capacity for change. These are the assets that we can use to put in service of a better world right now. What does that look like? So for our bodies, this, this things look different for each one of us, but I'll say that for those of us who want to be on the streets right now, we can use our bodies to be just an extra body on the streets. If we have, um, if we have a body that, that can wear some specific um, uniform or be or bring a specific skill. So I'm a clergy person. I always wear my clergy collar when I'm out um, on the streets because that means something different than just me in civilian clothes. So I use my body in uniform out on the streets. You might be a nurse or a doctor and you're using your, your skill to be a medic. You might be a journalist and you're using your skill to take pictures of people. We can use our bodies in service of this movement right now. If you're a white person, I invite you to think about how you're using your body, particularly out on the streets. Again, we, we know that police violence is less likely to happen to white people. And so when white people put their bodies in between police and uh, communities of color, people of color, organizers of color, it is less likely that violence will happen to people of color. But the choices that we as white people, those of us who are white, make out in the streets, any impact or retaliation from those choices often lands on our siblings of color. So we have to think really carefully about how we use our bodies when we're out there. Because if I, um, if I put graffiti on something, what is more likely is that the black person next to me is going to get arrested on the way out of that action than I will. So think about how you use your body. If you're a person of color in this movement, Use your body to find joy out in the streets. Find other people who are celebrating this movement and this uprising right now and find community and ways to heal the trauma from decades of racism that, that, our, uh, that your body has been dealing with as a person of color. So use our bodies. Use our presences. That's one of the other links that is on here. We can use our presence to witness um, when police violence happens or even just police um, presence looks threatening. So one of the things that we can do if we see, um, any of us can do, if we see police descending on someone, especially someone who looks vulnerable um, or someone or, who, or a group of people who are, who are of color, we can just stand there and witness 
because if it's witnessed, it's less likely to be escalated by the police. If it seems like it's going to be escalated, we can film it. And one of the links, um, yeah, thanks, Hannah. One of the links that we just put in the chat again is this great guide by Teen Vogue of all magazines about how to ethically um, how to ethically witness um, and live stream or or record. Um, police action. So you can use your bodies just in witness in the water. So even if you're not going out into the streets, if you're on the way to the grocery store and you see police descending on someone who looks vulnerable, um, you can just stand there and watch until it dissipates and you can film if it seems like it's needed. That will make a difference right now. So we can use our bodies. We can use our presence in service of a better world. We can use our resources and our talents and our skills. So one of the things we as a church have done has been donating um, to, to wider causes, and that is a huge, huge gift. We need to be donating to black-led uh, organizing organizations right now. But for those of us who can't do that, who don't have a, additional resources, and those who even can, not only do we can we donate additional money, but we can divert the way that our resources are spent to be supporting black and brown owned businesses rather than pre predominantly white owned businesses. So that doesn't involve spending more money. It just involves making more intentional choices with how our money is spent and who is receiving the benefit of our business. That's something that each one of us can do. And there's, and Hannah, thank you, Hannah and Rick, for putting links into some of the black owned businesses here in Philadelphia. You can do a quick Google search wherever you are to find black and brown uh, owned businesses in your area and see if there's ways that you can support those businesses right now with the same dollars that you would spend um, for another business. That's how we can use our resources. We also all have talents and skills. If you're a graphic designer, you can help make signs. Um, if you are a uh, lawyer, you can use some of your legal expertise to support an organization like Up Against the Wall Legal Collective right now who is, who is doing support for um, protesters and, and people who are getting arrested right now after curfew. Um, if you just have good organizational skills, you can support um, the Up Against the Wall Legal Collective doing jail support. That's something that involves basically like answering the phone a lot and trying to figure out where protesters have been, are being booked and what their contact information is and connecting them with their loved ones and connecting them with rides home once they get released. It's something that you can do from your home, from your couch with a phone and a computer. And again, um, take a look at Up Against the Wall Legal Collective. You don't have to be a lawyer or really have any skill like that um, to be able to help in that way right now. And you can do it from your own home. If you're a baker, you can bake cookies and hand them out to people on the streets right now. Or if you can't be out on the street, you can get them to be dropped off at a protest supply distribution site and have those, um, have them sent out. Each one of us has some kind of talent or skill that we can put in service of this movement. And it's not just this presence on the street that matters right now. It's calling our representatives. It's fighting for a more fair budget. It's doing the continued work that this congregation is doing for voter registration and voter education. Um, it's all of the long-term work that is going to untangle and dismantle this system of systemic racism in our country. Okay, so we can use our bodies and our presence. We can use our resources and our talents and our skills. We can use our relationships and our influence. All of us have people that we are in relationship in our lives. And I think all of us know that there are some people that, um, that we have avoided hard conversations with because it's felt too difficult or it's felt too uncomfortable. Um, one of the things that each one of us can do is begin to, to move into some of those hard conversations. If someone has said something that you, that you know is not right or sits with you the wrong way, or maybe just challenges you, you can enter into a conversation with that person about why they said that, where that came from, and what it meant to you. Um, these kinds of relationship conversations that we have um, mean so much more than a, you know posting um, on Facebook. They mean so much more than just um, putting up the thing that seems the most woke statement that we can put on our social media presence. Because conversations that we have within relationship come from that context of love and accountability and, um, 
and depth and longevity that allow more transformation to take place. So I invite you to use your relationships as a place both to learn and be challenged yourself and also to help challenge and support other people in their learning and growth. And speaking of your learning and growth, your last asset that, um, that I want to talk about today is, is using our capacity for, for change in service of a better world. The work that we can do in this area is around educating ourselves. It's around reading up and um, build, dig, digging into our own resiliency. It's about thinking about those times when we've been transformed before and what was involved with those moments of transformation in our lives. What did we need in order to make that transformation possible? What did we have to give up to make that transformation possible? So I know some of the things that we're doing in our household is we are um, building our summer reading lists around racial justice work and around histories of um, racism and white supremacy in this country. We are watching feel-good TV shows like The Great British Baking Show and Queer Eye, which the Philly season of Queer Eye just came out, in case those of you who didn't know. We're watching those feel-good shows, but we're also walking, watching um, documentaries about the the criminal justice system and about the history of racism in America. We're using our capacity to grow and change and our, our time that we devote to learning and to entertainment to transform ourselves. I invite you to do that as well and lean into your own ability to transform as one of your greatest, greatest assets. Our universalist theology tells us that we are, none of us are beyond salvation, that there is no part of us that is beyond redemption or transformation. My friends, I hope that you will pray and sing in this week and these coming weeks. I hope that you will find ways to connect with others, with those that you're in relationship with, with your own resources and using them in service of a better world. I hope that you will use your body in service of a better world. We know that um, saying Black Lives Matter matters very little right now if we're not also talking about what the Black Lives Matter movement is calling for, which is defunding of police departments. That's a complicated, it's a complicated um, issue. It's a complicated issue for many of us. A lot of us don't really understand what that means or what it could look like. A lot of us, um, I know that I have felt like I'm lacking the holy imagination to see what something different would look like because I've never seen it in my lifetime. But what we, are, um, what we are being called to do right now, if we say Black Lives Matter, we need to also be thinking about what it means to defund police departments and envision a new way to care for one another as a society. These, this is part of what we're being called to do right now, and it's drawing on everything we've got to figure out how to play a role in this movement. I hope that you will join me in finding, finding what your work is to do. I hope that you will call me out when I'm doing it wrong, and that you will help not only yourselves and those you love and the communities that you are a part of, but I hope you will help this community figure out new and better ways to be involved in supporting this movement for black lives. Something that um, I've seen a couple of you post, the first person who I saw post it was my mom. I didn't, I didn't give you a heads up that I was gonna tell you about your Facebook post today, mom, but I know you're here. Thanks mom for posting this. I really appreciate, appreciated reading it on your, on your Facebook wall earlier, today, er, earlier this week. It's, um, it's a, a meme that's going around and it says this, some are posting on social media, some are protesting in the streets, some are donating silently, some are educating themselves, some are having tough conversations with friends and family. A revolution has many lanes. Be kind to yourself and to others who are traveling in the same direction. Just keep your foot on the gas. May it be so, and amen.